Hello, and welcome to Curiosity Chapters, the channel where we explore the fascinating stories behind the things we say and do. In this video series, we will look at the curiosities of popular sayings and discover their origins, meanings, and uses. We will learn how these sayings came to be and how they reflect the culture and history of the people who use them. We will also see how these sayings have changed over time and how they are still relevant and useful today. So, let's begin with our first saying. Turn a blind eye. This phrase has its roots in a dramatic episode that occurred in the early 1800s amid the Napoleonic Wars. Britain was locked in a conflict with France and its allies, such as Denmark and Norway. A British naval force commanded by Admiral Sir Hyde Parker set sail for Copenhagen, Denmark's capital, where the Danish-Norwegian Navy was moored. The British aimed to stop the Danes from siding with the French and to capture their vessels and resources. But the British encountered more resistance than they expected. The Danish-Norwegian Navy fought back fiercely and damaged many British ships. The weather conditions were also adverse, with strong winds and fog reducing the visibility. Admiral Parker, who observed the battle from afar, grew anxious that the British would face a defeat. He signaled his deputy, Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson, to retreat from the combat. Nelson, however, had a different plan. He was a fearless and adventurous leader, who had already sacrificed his right eye and his right arm in previous battles. He was also a skilled strategist, who excelled at finding and exploiting the enemy's vulnerabilities. He was confident that he could still win the battle, if he could approach the Danish-Norwegian ships and fire his cannons at them. He ignored the signal from Parker. He lifted his telescope to his blind eye and told one of his officers, I really do not see the signal. He instructed his ships to press on with the attack and to disregard any more signals from Parker. He justified his actions later. I have the right to be blind sometimes. Nelson's risk paid off. After several more hours of intense fighting, the Danish-Norwegian Navy surrendered and the British secured a decisive victory. Nelson was celebrated as a hero and Parker was recalled and replaced by Nelson. The Battle of Copenhagen was one of Nelson's most renowned victories and it established his reputation as one of the greatest naval commanders in history. But did Nelson really say those words about his blind eye? Or was it just a legend? Some historians have disputed the truth of Nelson's quip and argued that he actually saw the signal, but chose to disobey it. They note that there is no eyewitness account of Nelson's words, and that they were first mentioned in a biography of Nelson published in 1814, 13 years after the battle, and nine years after Nelson's death at the Battle of Trafalgar. They also propose that Nelson's telescope was too big to fit into his eye socket, and that he would have used his left hand to hold it since his right arm was missing. Others, however, have supported the validity of Nelson's quip and argued that it matched his personality and style. They cite several sources that corroborate the story, including letters and memoirs from Nelson's friends and colleagues, and that the biography of 1814 was based on trustworthy information. They also emphasize that Nelson was known for his humor and wit, and that he often joked about his injuries and disabilities. They say that Nelson's quip was a smart way of expressing his defiance and determination, and that it reflected the spirit of the battle and the era. True or not, the story of Nelson's blind eye has become a part of the British culture and history, and the phrase, turn a blind eye, has entered the English language as a way of describing a deliberate refusal to acknowledge a certain reality. It is often used in a negative sense, to criticize someone who ignores a problem or a wrongdoing. But it can also be used in a positive or humorous way to suggest a lenient or tolerant attitude towards something that is not very important or harmful. Crocodile Tears Have you ever shed crocodile tears? If you have, you probably know that it means to fake being sad or sorry when you are actually not. But where does this expression come from and what does it have to do with crocodiles? Let's discover. The origin of this expression goes back to a medieval belief that crocodiles wept while devouring their victims. This belief was spread by a book called The Travels of Sir John Mandeville, which was written in the 14th century. The book claimed to be a true account of the author's travels in Asia, but it was actually a blend of fiction and fantasy. The book was full of strange and wonderful stories, such as people with dog heads, islands of fire, 
and mountains of gold. One of the stories was about crocodiles and how they enticed their prey with their tears. The book said, and these serpents kill men, and they eat them weeping, and when they eat they move the overjaw and not the nether jaw, and they have no tongue. The book was very popular and influential, and it inspired many other writers and explorers. However, the book was also very inaccurate and misleading, and it created many myths and misunderstandings. One of them was the idea that crocodiles cried while eating, which was later shown to be false by naturalists and zoologists. Crocodiles do have tear ducts, but they use them to wet their eyes, not to show emotions. They also do not move their upper jaw, but their lower jaw, and they do have tongues, although they are very small and attached to the bottom of their mouths. Despite being disproved by science, the myth of the crocodile tears remained in literature and culture. It was used by many famous writers, such as Shakespeare, who wrote in Othello, O oh, devil, devil, if that the earth could teem with woman's tears, each drop she falls would prove a crocodile. The expression crocodile tears became an idiom in the 16th century, and it meant to display false or insincere sorrow or regret. It is often used to criticize or mock someone who pretends to care, but actually does not. For example, a politician who cries for the poor, but does nothing to help them, or a cheater who apologizes for hurting their partner, but does not change their behavior, can both be blamed for crying crocodile tears. Die Hard. Have you ever earned the label of a die-hard fan, a die-hard gamer, or a die-hard optimist? If you have, you probably know that it means to be very faithful, passionate, or stubborn about something, even when it is hard or unpopular. But where does this word come from, and what does it have to do with dying hard? Let's learn. The origin of this word goes back to a grim and gruesome practice that was widespread in the 1700s, hanging. Hanging was a form of execution that involved dangling a person by a rope around their neck until they died of choking or suffocating. It was a cruel and painful way to die, and it often took a long time for the victim to lose awareness and stop breathing. Some people, however, showed remarkable resilience and stamina and resisted death for as long as they could. These people were called diehards because they died hard or with difficulty. The word diehard became more popular and famous after a heroic and bloody event that occurred in the early 19th century during the Napoleonic Wars. At that time, Britain and its allies were battling against France and its allies led by the ambitious and powerful Napoleon Bonaparte. In 1811, a British army along with Spanish and Portuguese troops confronted a French army at the Battle of Albuera in Spain. The battle was fierce and chaotic and both sides suffered heavy losses. One of the British units that fought bravely and fiercely was the 57th Regiment of Foot, commanded by Colonel William Inglis. Inglis was injured early in the battle, but he refused to leave the field. He lay on the ground and shouted to his men, stand your ground and die hard and let the enemy pay dearly for each of us. His words inspired his soldiers to fight on, despite being outnumbered and outgunned. The 57th Regiment suffered a staggering 75% casualties, but they held their position and repelled the French attacks. Their courage and determination earned them the admiration and respect of their allies and enemies, and they became known as the diehards. The word diehard soon became an adjective, and it meant to be very committed, resolute, or opposed to change. It is often used to describe people who have strong views or convictions and who do not give up or compromise easily. For example, a die-hard supporter of a political party, a die-hard fan of a sports team, or a die-hard opponent of a new policy can all be called die-hards. The word can also be used to describe things that are very sturdy, dependable, or persistent. For example, a die-hard battery, a die-hard plant, or a die-hard virus can all be called die-hards. Resting on your laurels. Have you ever heard someone say that you should stop resting on your laurels? If you have, you probably know that it means to stop being content with your past achievements and to start working harder or aiming higher. But where does this expression come from and what does it have to do with laurels? Let's learn. The origin of this expression goes back to the ancient civilizations of Greece and Rome, where laurels were not just plants, 
They were symbols of honor and glory, and they were closely linked to the god Apollo. Apollo was the god of many things, such as music, poetry, prophecy, and healing. He was also the patron god of the Pythian Games, a series of athletic and artistic competitions that were held every four years in Delphi, the site of his oracle. Apollo was often shown wearing a wreath or a crown made of laurel leaves, which were said to have grown from the blood of a nymph he loved and killed by mistake. Because of their connection to Apollo, laurels became a sign of excellence and achievement. The winners of the Pythian Games, as well as other games such as the Olympic Games, were given wreaths of laurel branches, which they wore on their heads as a mark of distinction and pride. The laurel wreaths were also given to other people who excelled in various fields, such as poets, scholars, artists, and leaders. These people were called laureates, which means crowned with laurels. The tradition of honoring laureates with laurel wreaths was later followed by the Romans, who admired and copied the Greek culture and religion. The Romans also gave laurel wreaths to their victorious generals, who paraded through the streets of Rome in a ceremony called a triumph. The laurel wreaths were a symbol of the general's military skill and authority, and they were also thought to protect them from the jealousy of the gods and the people. The expression, resting on your laurels, originally meant to enjoy the fame and respect that came from being a laureate, and to bask in the glory of your past achievements. It was not a negative or a critical expression, but rather a positive or a neutral one. It implied that you had done something remarkable or admirable, and that you deserved to be recognized and rewarded for it. However, over time, the expression changed its meaning and tone, and it became a way of saying that someone was being lazy, arrogant, or complacent. It suggested that someone was depending too much on their previous successes, and that they were not trying to improve themselves or to face new challenges. It implied that someone was wasting their potential and that they were risking losing their reputation or their position. It became a warning or a rebuke rather than a compliment or a praise. P's and Q's. Have you ever heard someone say that you should mind your P's and Q's? If you have, you probably know that it means to be careful about what you say or do and to behave politely and correctly. But where does this expression come from, and what do P's and Q's have to do with anything? The origin of this expression is not certain, and there are many theories and explanations. One of the most popular and plausible theories is that the expression comes from the printing industry, which dates back to the 15th century. At that time, printing was done by arranging small metal blocks called type that had letters, numbers, and symbols on them. The type was then inked and pressed onto paper to create books, newspapers, and other documents. However, the type had to be arranged in a reversed and inverted order so that the final print would appear correctly. This was a difficult and tedious task, and it was easy to make mistakes, especially with letters that looked similar, such as P and Q. Printers had to be very careful and attentive, and they had to mind their P's and Q's, or else they would end up with a faulty and unreadable print. Another popular and plausible theory is that the expression comes from the pub industry, which dates back to the 17th century. At that time, pubs were places where people drank beer and ale, which were served in pint and quart containers. The pub owners had to keep track of how many pints and quarts each customer drank so that they could charge them accordingly. The pub owners would write down the letters P and Q, along with the numbers, on a chalkboard or a piece of paper. However, the pub owners had to be very careful and honest, and they had to mind their P's and Q's, or else they would end up with a wrong and unfair bill. There are other theories and explanations for the origin of this expression, such as the ones that related to the French words paids and Q's, which mean feet and wigs, or the ones that related to the English words please and thank you. However, these theories are less likely and less supported by evidence. The expression, mind your P's and Q's, became a part of the English language, and it was used to advise or warn someone to be careful about their manners, words, or actions. It was often used by parents, teachers, or elders to instruct or remind children or young people to behave well and respectfully. For example, a parent might say to their child, mind your P's and Q's when you visit your grandparents, or a teacher might say to their student, mind your P's and Q's when you speak to the principal. Paint the town red. 
Have you ever gone out and painted the town red? If you have, you probably know that it means to have a lot of fun and excitement, usually involving drinking and partying. But where does this expression come from? And what does it have to do with painting and red? Let's discover. The origin of this expression goes back to a notorious incident that occurred in the 19th century in a small town in England. The town was called Melton Mowbray, and it was famous for its cheese, pies, and hunting. It was also the site of a wild and crazy night led by a notorious nobleman and his friends. The nobleman was Henry de la Puer Beresford, the third Marquis of Waterford. He was known for his love of mischief and drinking, and he often got into trouble with the law. He was also a skilled horseman and a brave soldier who fought in the Napoleonic Wars. In 1837, the Marquis of Waterford and his friends came to Melton Mowbray after a day of hunting. They decided to have some fun in the town, and they started drinking and gambling in a local inn. They soon got bored, and they decided to cause some trouble in the streets. They knocked over flower pots, pulled off door knockers, broke windows and threw stones at the town hall. They also attacked the local constable who tried to stop them. But the most outrageous thing they did was to paint several parts of the town with red paint. They painted a toll gate, the doors of some houses, and even a statue of a swan, which was the symbol of the town. They used buckets of red paint, which they had stolen from a painter's shop. They left a trail of red all over the town, and they laughed and cheered as they did it. The next morning, the townspeople were shocked and outraged by the damage and the mess. They quickly identified the culprits, and they demanded justice and compensation. The Marquis of Waterford and his friends were arrested and fined, and they had to pay for the repairs and the cleaning. They also had to apologize to the town and the constable, and they promised to behave better in the future. The Marquis of Waterford later became a more respectable and religious person, and he even donated money to the town for a new water supply. The story of the Marquis of Waterford and his friends became famous, and it was widely reported in the newspapers and the magazines. It was also the likely source of the expression, paint the town red, which meant to have a wild and reckless night out involving drinking and vandalism. The expression became popular in the English language and it was used by many writers and speakers, such as Mark Twain, Rudyard Kipling, and Winston Churchill. However, there is another theory that suggests that the expression, paint the town red, originated in a different place and time. Some people believe that the expression came from the American West in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. At that time, many towns in the West had areas that were known as the red light districts, where prostitution, gambling, and drinking were common and legal. These areas were often marked by red lanterns or signs to indicate their nature and location. Some men, especially cowboys and miners, who had money and time to spare, would visit these areas and have a lot of fun and pleasure. They would act as if the whole town was a red light district, and they would paint the town red, figuratively speaking. While this theory is plausible and appealing, there is not much evidence to support it. There are no records or references of the expression paint the town red being used in the American West until the late 20th century. The earliest known use of the expression in America was in 1884 in a newspaper article from New York which quoted an English source. The expression was probably imported from England and not invented in America. Run amok. Have you ever witnessed someone run amok? If you have, you probably know that it means to act in a violent or chaotic way, without any reason or control. But where does this expression come from, and what does it have to do with a rare and mysterious mental disorder? Let's learn. The origin of this expression goes back to a cultural and medical phenomenon that was observed in Southeast Asia, especially in Malaysia and Indonesia. The phenomenon was called amok and it involved a sudden and unprovoked attack by a person who would run around and kill or injure anyone in their path. The person who ran amok was usually a male, who had no history of violence or mental illness, and who had suffered some kind of stress or humiliation. The person who ran amok would act as if they were in a trance or a rage, and they would not respond to any attempts to stop them or reason with them. The person who ran amok would either die by suicide, by being killed by others, or by being captured and arrested. 
The phenomenon of Amok fascinated and terrified the European travelers and colonizers who encountered it in the 18th and 19th centuries. They tried to explain and understand it using their own cultural and scientific frameworks. The word Amok came from the Malay word Mengamuk, which meant to attack furiously. The word was also related to the name of the Amuko, a group of Javanese and Malay warriors who were known for their fierce and reckless fighting style. The Europeans also associated Amuk with the influence of evil spirits, drugs or magic, and they considered it a form of madness or savagery. One of the first and most famous accounts of Amuk was written by Captain James Cook, the British explorer and navigator who witnessed it in 1770 during his voyage around the world. Cook wrote in his journal, We were witnesses to one of those sudden and unaccountable transports of frenzy to which the Indians are subject and which they call a muck. A Malay who had been among us and received presents and who, as we thought, had gone away well satisfied, came running down the hill with a kind of short sword in his hand and without the least provocation fell upon every person he met with indiscriminate fury. He wounded several of our people and, among others, the corporal of the guard who, in his defense, was obliged to shoot him dead. Cook's description of Amok was later quoted and cited by many other writers and scholars who tried to study and analyze the phenomenon. Some of them regarded Amok as a cultural or religious practice, while others regarded it as a psychological or medical condition. In the 20th century, Amok was recognized as a diagnosable mental disorder and it was included in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM, the official handbook of psychiatry. According to the DSM, amok is a dissociative disorder, which means that the person who runs amok loses their sense of identity and reality and acts in a way that is contrary to their normal personality and behavior. The DSM also states that amok is a culture-bound syndrome, which means that it is specific to a certain culture or region and that it is influenced by the social and environmental factors of that culture or region. The expression running amok has become a part of the English language and it is used to describe any situation or behavior that is wild, chaotic or out of control. It is often used in a humorous or exaggerated way to refer to something that is not as serious or dangerous as the original phenomenon of amok. For example, a person might say that their children are running amok in the house, or that their dog is running amok in the park, or that their computer is running amok and deleting their files. By and large, have you heard people saying by and large while in a conversation? If you have, you probably know that it means generally speaking or on the whole. But why do we use this phrase, and what does it have to do with sailing and wind? Let's find out. The origin of this phrase can be traced back to the nautical language of the 16th and 17th centuries, when sailing was the main mode of transportation and exploration. At that time, sailors had to deal with different wind conditions, which affected the speed and direction of their ships. They used different terms to describe how their ships sailed in relation to the wind, and two of these terms were by and large. The term by meant that the ship was sailing close to the wind or against the wind, this was a difficult and slow way of sailing as the ship had to zigzag or tack to make progress. The term full and by meant that the ship was sailing as close to the wind as possible without losing speed or control. The term by came from the Old English word be, which meant near or by the side of. The term large meant that the ship was sailing with the wind or downwind. This was an easy and fast way of sailing, as the ship could go straight ahead with the wind behind it. The term large came from the old French word large, which meant broad or wide. The phrase by and large meant that the ship was sailing in any and all directions relative to the wind, whether close to the wind or with the wind. It implied that the ship was versatile and adaptable, and that it could handle any wind situation. The phrase by and large was first recorded in a sailing manual in 1669, and it was used by many sailors and captains such as Samuel Pepys, James Cook, and Horatio Nelson. The phrase by and large later became a part of the English language, and it was used to describe any situation or condition that was general or overall, rather than specific or particular. It was often used to qualify or modify a statement. 
to indicate that there might be some exceptions or variations, but that the main point or idea was still valid or true. For example, it could be said that by and large people are kind-hearted, or by and large the weather is agreeable, or by and large that was a positive outcome. The third degree. Have you ever experienced the third degree? If you have, you probably know that it means to be interrogated or questioned harshly, usually by someone in authority. But where does this expression come from, and what does it have to do with the Freemasons, an ancient secret society? Well, no, a society with secrets. The Freemasons' future content. But for now, let's get back to the third degree phase. The origin of this expression goes back to the ritual and practice of the Freemasons, a fraternal organization that dates back to the Middle Ages. The Freemasons are known for their symbols, ceremonies, and secrets, and for their influence in various fields, such as politics, religion, and science. The Freemasons have different levels or degrees of membership, which are based on their knowledge and skills. The first degree is called Entered Apprentice, the second degree is called Fellowcraft, and the third degree is called Master Mason. The third degree is the highest and most prestigious degree in the Freemasons, and it requires a lot of preparation and examination. To become a Master Mason, a candidate has to go through a series of tests and challenges which involve learning and reciting various passwords, signs and grips, as well as answering questions about the history and philosophy of the Freemasons. The candidate also has to participate in a dramatic and symbolic ceremony, which represents the death and resurrection of Hiram Abiff, the legendary architect of King Solomon's temple. The ceremony is meant to teach the candidate about loyalty, morality and immortality. The candidate who passes the third degree becomes a master mason and gains access to the secrets and privileges of the Freemasons. The phrase the third degree comes from the difficulty and intensity of the test and ceremony that the candidate has to undergo to become a master mason. The phrase was first used in a Masonic context in 1723 in a book called The Constitutions of the Freemasons One, which was written by James Anderson, a Scottish historian and Freemason. The book said, in order to make a good and perfect lodge, there must be at least five, va the master, two wardens, and two fellow craft, besides seven entered apprentices, all under the tongue of good report. But if there be more, it is so much the better, provided they are of the third degree. The phrase, the third degree, later became a part of the English language, and it was used to describe any kind of severe or thorough interrogation or questioning, especially by the police or the courts. The phrase was popularized by the American writer and journalist O. Henry, who used it in several of his stories, such as The Voice of the City, published in 1908. He wrote, The cop walked up to the crook and gave him the third degree. He asked him where he had been, what he had done, and who he had seen. He searched his pockets, his hat, and his shoes. He made him tell his name, his address, and his occupation. He grilled him for an hour until he was satisfied that he had nothing to do with the crime. The phrase, the third degree, is still used today to refer to any situation or behavior that involves intense or harsh scrutiny or pressure. It is often used by people who feel that they are being treated unfairly or unjustly, or who want to avoid or escape from a difficult or unpleasant conversation. For example, a person might say that they don't want to go to the doctor because they don't want to get the third degree about their health, or that they don't want to meet their in-laws because they always give them the third degree about their marriage. That's all for part one of our series on the curiosities of popular sayings. I hope you enjoyed learning about the origins, meanings and uses of these expressions, and how they reflect the culture and history of the people who use them. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to be notified of our new uploads. In part two of this series, we will explore more curious and fascinating sayings, such as break a leg, kick the bucket and bite the bullet. Stay tuned and thanks for watching Curiosity Chapters.